This week on Houston Newsmakers, Neil Bush, as we dig into a number of important topics in his role as co-chair of the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation, he and the organization's president are here to talk about the importance of reading and the big event coming up that will celebrate the fight to increase literacy rates here in Houston. Neil Bush also wears another hat, that of finance committee member of the Ted Cruz for President campaign. We'll talk about why he's made that move and much more about the current political landscape. And State Representative Ron Reynolds fighting for his name as he fights a conviction and faces a runoff for his District 27 seat. From KPRC Channel 2, this is Houston Newsmakers with Cambrell Marshall. Good morning and welcome to Houston Newsmakers in the middle of what's known as March Madness by basketball fans, but it's also, and perhaps more importantly, now known as National Read Aloud Month. Here to talk about what that means and the benefits for all of us is Neil Bush, co-chair and co-founder of the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation and foundation president, Dr. Julie Baker Fink. Good morning to both of you. I'll probably overstretch it a little bit calling it uh, the March Madness and maybe Read Aloud Month, but it should gain in popularity. It's very important, is it not? It's just, it's just critical, Campbell. And everybody you talk to understands intuitively the importance of reading. And if you can't read at a, an age-appropriate level at any stage of your life, whether you're, you know, from the very beginning of life through through adulthood, you can't possibly realize your God-given potential. So I'm so proud of what the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation has been doing the past two and a half years under the leadership of Dr. Julie Baker Fink to mobilize the community to raise awareness of this issue. And March uh, March will become better known as Read Aloud Month. It may never overtake uh, you know March Madness from a basketball context, yeah. but it's really as important for sure. This is an offshoot is and not from your mom's national uh, it foundation. Is. Her national foundation for over 25 years has focused on adult literacy, you know, trying to um, implement, break the intergenerational cycle of, of illiteracy by bringing kids into the picture when they're in, in, in adult learning centers. Our focus here in Houston is different. We're, we're trying to mobilize the entire community in different ways try to raise awareness of the crisis and we're shamelessly using Barbara Bush's you know uh, her famous legacy interest as the first lady of literacy uh, right here in her own backyard and Julie this organization has been very active early on it was all about getting people together was it not and how's that working absolutely from the very onset it was about bringing the community together to look at the problems that we have in our community around low literacy and so we partnered with experts at Deloitte and brought together over 100 community leaders over a seven month period to look at all of the data uh, mine research but also to put together a very thoughtful and coherent plan of action that we call our blueprint for community action and since that time we've been really mobilizing the community and trying to inject um, resources to reach our goals. And how important is it to keep uh, Mrs. Bush um, as the figure I mean I've seen her out and she's reading to these kids and she is loving it and it, how important is it to keep her involved as a figurehead? I know that it's kind of tough to not keep her involved. Quite well, we love that she wants to be involved, Cambrell. Right. We love having her out in the community and she was recently with us when we kicked off March uh, Read Aloud Month on March 2nd. It was Dr. Seuss's birthday, but it was also um, National um, Read Across America Day, and so Mrs. Bush came out into the community, read it to a group of kids at Walnut Bend, and she's just such an inspiration and a magnet for you know just the kids and the people, and so you know we're here to um, you know continue her forth her legacy interest, and we love when she's with us. For those parents who may be watching right now, who may not know how important it is to read aloud. I mean, just saying it is one thing, but reading aloud, what does it do that's specific and important in a child's life? Well, actually, reading aloud is one of the most important things that parents and other caring adults of children can do um, on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's what Read Aloud Month promotes, is reading aloud at least 15 minutes every day with your child, making it a daily habit. And it's really important because for very young children, even from birth, reading aloud helps them develop strong oral language um, skills, um, helps them understand how to put words and recognize words um, together and hopefully build that, um, that sense of love for reading and it also helps to build a strong foundation for vocabulary which then in later life um, helps to influence a child's reading comprehension level. So the, just reading aloud, um, talking with kids about um, what they're reading is such an important um, strategy that's, that every, every parent should be doing. When we think about strategies, what is the 
foundation doing uh, when you look at the big picture to try to change the dynamic about the literacy rates in Houston? Well, uh, first and foremost, we're trying to raise awareness around the crisis. And if you go to our website, um, BushHoustonLiteracy.org, you'll find the full report. Um, and it's a crisis that affects all age groups. Secondly, um, Julie and her team have done a fabulous job of building collaborations between organizations that aren't necessarily literacy focused, but, uh, but work with the kids that are the, you know, that are the target for our, our campaigns. And thirdly, we're building coalitions. We're, we're helping the Early Matters Coalition citywide, mm -hmm. and we're working closely to develop neighborhood coalitions so that the, hot, the impact can be really highly felt in elementary schools. And a a lot of this work has to happen before kids get to elementary school. Right. You know, we've got a word gap, we've got a book gap, we've got kids entering kindergarten ill-prepared to learn, and so we've got to address the issue from birth through third grade so that every kid reads at a third grade competency before they go to fourth grade. And once March is over, you have a big event, a fabulous event coming up in April. Talk about what that is and, and the, the people, who the headliners who are coming in. Well, I'll save the headlines for Neil, but our event is called A Celebration of Reading. This will be our 22nd annual Celebration of Reading, benefiting um, the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation and the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy. And we're just thrilled to have an amazing lineup of speakers. It'll be at the Hobby Center on the evening of April 21st, and so tickets and tables can still be purchased for this event. Um, but we have a great lineup of uh, fantastic authors. And you want to pick that up and okay. say something? <laughs> yeah. Well, we have Kelly Corrigan. We have Scott Simon, who's a PBS um, you know, reporter who wrote about his mom. Um, we've got Brad Meltzer, who's a best-selling author, and we've got John Meacham, who who wrote the uh, most recent biography about my father. It's a great book. It's just um, he's he's a he's a great biographer. Anyway, he's written about a historic figure. He's been and he worked many years with access, full access to everything related to to dad's. Legacy and there's some, it's all mostly good. My dad is my hero, of course, and so the book reflects his great leadership and his personal qualities and made him greatly. But there's some things in there that I didn't know about. It's, it, so it's going to be a fabulous event. I would think that any, anybody who's a fan of your mother and your father should go to that event. I've had a chance to watch and read some of the book that he's written about your dad and about the legacy of the Bush family. And it is just amazing. 6.30, April 21st, Hobby Center. It's going to be there. You have to get there, and you have to go to this website, this, the, the Bush um, What's the website again? Bush, Bush Literacy. Um. BushHoustonLiteracy.org. <laughs> BushHoustonLiteracy.org. BushHoustonLiteracy.org. I had that written up there once upon a time, and I dropped it off there for some reason. But BushHoustonLiteracy.org, you can't forget that. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> be there April 21st. I'm going to try to make sure that I'm there. After March, yeah, you got to get something else to be excited about, and that's it. Yes, it's very exciting. Dr. Julie, good to see you as always thank again. You. And Neil, good to see you hey, as bro, well. Thank you. And Thanks thank you, you for do. sticking around, because you're going to stick I around know. and talk some other stuff. Yeah, coming up here next segment here. We're going to talk politics as you support Ted Cruz for President of the United States. We'll talk about that and more about the political landscape. That's next when Houston Newsmakers continues. Welcome back to Houston Newsmakers. One month ago, Jeb Bush suspended his campaign for president after falling far short of expectations in primaries in Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina. That final loss coming after bringing President George W. Bush, Mrs. Laura Bush, Barbara Bush out to campaign for him as well. Question is, how difficult was that as a family to see that happen? Because, you know, you, I know you want your brother to do well. I mean, it's frustrating, honestly. I mean, it, it was very clear to me after campaigning for and with my brother Jeb that he was really well qualified to lead the country. If you look at his track record as governor of Florida, he implemented conservative, reform minded changes there. And, and if he could do the same in Washington, our country would be far better off than it, than it is now. Um, but it wasn't his year. Mm -hmm. There's just something strange going on in the political winds, especially on the Republican side, that's taken all, you know, issues and pragmatic thought and, you know, careful consideration. All the debate has been kind of dominated by personal insults and bullying and, and you know, non-issue related campaign oriented, you know. Well, it, so. it took Jeb getting into the race for your brother, President George W. to get in right. and for your mom to get in. They weren't going to be in it any other way probably and now they've stepped back but out of the spotlight but you're back in now you've been a part of the Ted Cruz campaign yes is Ted Cruz is kind of like I wouldn't expect you to be supporting Ted he wouldn't Cruz. be my honestly wasn't my first choice Jeb was um, he's not 
frankly, my second choice. He's done a, he's done a lot to irritate people that I have a great deal of respect for. <laughs> and I um, mean, he's not the most popular guy among, among political allies of mine. The fact is, he's an he's a anti-establishment, Tea Party kind of personality. I guess I come from an establishment family. The reality is Donald Trump would be a disaster for our country. He'd be a disaster for the Republican Party. I was going to ask you about that, that this is so, as much an anti-Donald Trump as it is anything else. It but is. It is. I, I respect Ted Cruz's commitment to print to you know uh, committed conservative principles right. I like you know what you get with Texas. sure sure but Donald Trump, it is but there's clearly a, a high motivator is Donald Trump doesn't reflect what the best values of the United States of America he does not our country is the greatest country on the face of the planet in spite of what he says uh, the the president of the United States is the leader of the free world we want our president to reflect the values that have made his service above self you know where you can be strong and clear minded but like Ronald Reagan and George Herbert Walker Bush and George W. Bush, you can have strength and clear-minded commitment, but you can also serve with humility. Right. And Donald Trump oh. doesn't even come close to passing that litmus test. So I, I'm not going to take the, you know, the, I'm not going to drink the lemonade, and I'm not going to take the, the, you know, Trump pledge where he makes sure he puts the hands up. I will not support Donald Trump under any circumstances. And, and the only guy that has a real shot at beating him before the convention or getting more delegates at the convention is, is Ted Cruz. This whole process has been um, real frustrating for those who have been in love with the Republican Party. Quite frankly, um, it's torn it at the seams in a lot of places. Are you concerned about what this party is going to look like after this primary is over, no matter what happens? I'm, I'm concerned about um, what might happen at the convention. You know, if, if Trump goes in with a plurality, more delegates than anyone else, and, and at the convention he's denied the nomination, yeah, I think there's going to be chaos and there's going to be, he's already threatened riots. <laughs> so, but, but I'm, I'm subliminally. Not so sure. Yeah, subliminally, yeah. I mean, yeah. he just sends out the signal and says, I'm not going to incite riots. It's typical of, of what a Trump move. I'm not so sure it's going to have a damaging or negative impact over the long haul. Honestly, a lot of the people that are the most fervent followers, you know, are coming from outside of the party or, or you know, are part of a fringe element within the party. Right. He, has a, he has a solid base of fervent support that no one's going to peel that away from him. But he's also got a pretty solid ceiling above which he can't go. There are so many people that do not want to see a, a person with his behavioral attributes and character attributes, you know, go on to lead the party or become president. Talk about the convention for a second, because a lot of people are saying, well, if he goes in with a plurality or close to plurality, he ought to get it. The rules are such that you, you, you got to get to a certain number, and before yeah. you get to that number, all bets are off. I right. mean, what goes on, it's not going to be backroom stuff. It's all it's about, not, it's, it's out there. Back, it's, it's, I mean, all this stuff about a broker convention is just, it's, it's, you know, malarkey. There's no such thing in today's day and world where people sit in a room and decide who the nominee is going to be. Those delegates go. They're committed. Most of the delegates are committed through a single ballot. After that first ballot, if someone doesn't have a majority, they go to a second ballot. And you can switch and change. By the Jeb Bush, you know, delegates are going to go. We've got four. Rubio's got a bunch. Kasich, by the time he drops out, will have a bunch. Those de delegates will be able to go wherever they want to go. Mm -hmm. and, m and my hope is, if it does get to the point where there's an open convention, there's, that they'll go to, to a non-Trump person. We can't afford, you know, but now if Trump is like 100 away that, from the 1,237 needed, you know, then it's going to be really hard for the party to justify not having him get the, the, the you know, get the majority. So. But, you're, but now you're, you're supporting Ted Cruz. Are you hopeful that, uh, that Senator Cruz would at some point along the way understand what compromise actually means? Yes. Because up to now, yeah. that hasn't happened, and it's hurt him yeah. for, for a lot of people, even senators. There's nobody supporting so, him until they have to. So here, Cambrell, here's the deal. I, 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 I know Ted, and I like Ted, and I love his wife, Heidi. Um, Ted is uncompromised. He went to Washington with an uncompromising attitude to not, be, you know, go along and get along. He went there with a Tea Party kind of motive of shaking up what he calls the Washington cartel. If he's elected president, when he's elected president, he's going to be wearing a different hat. He's going to be wearing the hat of a guy who's going to work with Paul Ryan, with Senator McConnell, with the co with the leadership of the of the House and the Senate to make major reforms. And and to me, that's one of the biggest motivators. We've had we. We've had a stagnant government 
for so long. And I, you know, I'm not the kind of guy that blames Obama for everything. We've had a Congress that refuses to do what Obama wants. We have Obama refuses to do what Congress wants, so there's a divided government. We have a chance to have a united government that can lead in making major reforms to health care and to, to our welfare system, to the Social Security system. We have to address our debt. And, and I really believe that Ted Cruz could be part of that reform movement in a positive way. And so his, his, his difficulty in working with Washington has been part of who he has been as the outsider coming in. As president, it's going to be a totally different game. Well, I, I look forward to seeing what happens. I wish I had a crystal ball. <laughs> I know you do, too. Me, too. Thank you for coming Thanks, in. Though. We appreciate you coming in Thank and you. talking because none of the other Bushes will do it. So oh, good for on. you. Well, none, <laughs> none of the other Bushes live here. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. It's always Thank good you. to have you here. Appreciate it. Coming up. Another political race is ahead for state representative Ron Reynolds, now in a runoff to keep his seat as representative for District 27. The controversy and opponent he's facing. That's next when Houston Newsmakers continues. In KPRC Channel 2, this is Houston Newsmakers with Cambrell Marshall. And welcome back to Houston Newsmakers, and welcome to State Representative from District 27, Ron Reynolds. Good to see you. Cambrell, it's great to be here. Hey, your opponent, uh, Angelique Bartholomew, was here last week. We missed you. We wish we could have had you, but that's okay. We got you now. I want to talk to you now about a number of things. Um, you had three opponents in the general election. Are you surprised? Because you almost didn't have to go into a runoff. That's correct. Are you surprised at how well you finished in that N final test? Not at all. Uh, I'm very proud that uh, despite having three opponents and being last on the ballot in an anti-incumbent year, uh, I finished 48.5 percent, uh, double the number of votes that my second closest opponent received. So I'm, I'm just, it's a tribute to uh, the hard work that my staff and I do in our district. You have a lot of issues that uh, the opponents call attention to. You were convicted uh, of uh, bar barratry, you were sentenced. You're out now. You're appealing that. That's correct. Now, this, where's the, where's, where are we now in the appeal process? Well, Kimberl, What's the timing of absolutely. That? I'm glad you brought that up because my opponents made that a central issue of the campaign. They threw all kind of mud and tried to smear me the best they could, talking about the misdemeanor conviction. The misdemeanor conviction is on appeal right now. Uh, and every attorney that's looked at it, including Judge Morris Overstreet, a former uh, Court of Criminal Appeals Justice, said that the charges are pretty much frivolous. It was in Montgomery County. A lot of people know the history of Montgomery County. Uh, not many African Americans. Uh, and there was no evidence to convict me on the misdemeanor barratry conviction that I received. What are the challenges now going forward on appeal, though? Well, uh, I have a, a board-certified appellate criminal attorney that has reviewed the record. Uh, the case is currently pending on appeal. He's very confident that the case will be overturned. He said that it's one of the most egregious cases that he's seen in his over 30 years of practice in law. What do you tell the constituents of the 27th District about that process and how confident you are that it's going to be overturned, that it's not going to get in the way of you doing the business of your constituents? Ab absolutely. What I do, Cambrero, is what I've been doing from day one, is that I I'm always transparent, I'm open, I'm honest, I'm accessible. Uh, this has been no secret to the constituents. They knew the challenge that I had from Montgomery County. I had a town hall meeting to address it in Judge Klaus's courtroom. It was a packed courtroom. There were various community leaders, ministers that came out. I addressed what had recently happened in Montgomery County and reassured my constituents that I was innocent and that I would be vindicated on appeal. What is the priority for you in the district right now in terms of when you're the business of being a state rep? What is it right now that you look at, okay, this is the priority, this is what I want to look forward to in the next session? Well, Cambriel, the priority for me is always putting the interests of my constituents first. Uh, the priority from day one since my first term has been high quality public education. I've been fighting for public education since my first session. Uh, currently, uh, right now, the state of Texas is poorly funding our schools. We had, during the 82nd legislative second session, cut $5.4 billion from our, from our public schools, which was abysmal. And so right now, we're, we're fighting to restore those cuts. I'm fighting uh, for full-day funding for pre-K. Pre-K gives all of our children a level playing field so that no matter what 
kind of background children come from. A lot of parents, uh, a lot of children come from broken homes. Some uh, parents don't speak English. And so when you get a full day pre k program, these children get a high quality education and the statistics show that they're more likely to graduate. What do you think the chances are of uh, Angelique Bartholomew being able to pull together enough support from the folks who didn't vote for you in the primary to be able to overtake you in terms of keeping your seat? Well, uh, I, I think that's very slim. Uh, I, I have a lot of respect for her, uh, but uh, currently, uh, just so you know, the listeners know, uh, I currently serve as the House Democratic Whip, the number two in the leadership in the House. Uh, I'm endorsed by every Democrat elected official in Fort Bend County, every precinct chair in Fort Bend County, including Mayor Sylvester Turner, Congressman Al Green, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, and every other Democrat elected official in Fort Bend County. Uh, I'm very confident that the voters are going to vote for me for re-election because we work hard. We have a proven track record of success, including uh, I was helped partially responsible for passing the body camera legislation, uh, truancy reform, grand jury reform. So I have a strong record of legislative achievements. Well, I thank you for coming on. I hope next time maybe we can get you and Angelique I would love. I would May. love to be here. Absolutely. Okay, that would be great. She's ready to come back, too, as well. Let's do so it. Put the gloves on and go for it. I look forward to it. <laughs> thank you, Cam Brown. Appreciate Ron, you. Thank God you. bless you. Thank Appreciate you. It. Well, back after this break, uh, we're going to take a peek to next week when water is everywhere, but what about when it's not fit to drink? What's happening about what Houstonians can do to help? That's next. Next week, here on Houston Newsmakers, one of the topics is water and the tremendous problems facing the residents of Flint, Michigan, whose water supply has been tainted by dangerous levels of lead. There's a movement here in Houston to help the residents of Flint, how you can get involved and help as well next week here on Newsmakers. Thank you to my guests for joining me this morning. To see previous shows or get information on today's program, go to cook2houston.com and under the news banner, click on Newsmakers. Have a great day, everybody, and I'll see you back here again next week.